Okay, well, clearly we are overdue for an update given the amount of movement that we've seen on several of the topics that we've covered in the previous two videos. And so grab a tasty beverage and let's go ahead and break out the crystal ball and the tarot cards and see if we can make sense of the high bar acquisition from Tesla and take a look at some of our previous predictions and see if they still hold water. Okay, wow, what a couple of uh, what a couple of months it's been. Um, so, in recent events, uh, last month, month and a half or so uh, ago, uh, Tesla acquired a company called Highbar. Now, Highbar was a or is a Canadian company that specializes in making the machinery for making batteries. Now, I'd love to puff myself up and say that I saw that coming, but I did and I didn't. I saw something like it coming, but in my mind, that was going to take a slightly different path. I had thought that perhaps that there was enough expertise in Maxwell Technologies that because Maxwell Technologies had also been manufacturing cells and supercapacitors and, and other, uh, uh, other components, that uh, they would perhaps be the company that would be tapped on the shoulder and leveraged to start to make some of the machinery that would be necessary to go to this next step. And that then that machinery would perhaps be licensed and the um, processes then uh, uh, farmed out to Panasonic, LG Chem, whoever else they were going to be uh, working with. But in retrospect, when we look at the acquisition of Highbar, it makes perfect sense that they, uh, that they didn't then go to an existing manufacturer. And again, I think that all ties back to the fact that the batteries that they're going to be making are very different than the batteries that they're currently making. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit uh, uh, j in just a moment, but first, I want to cover some of the things that we seem to have gotten completely right. And the first of those, obviously, is the properties of this new battery. Now, in the first video, I had mentioned that uh, if we ever hear from Tesla that these new batteries actually have a period in their lifespan early on where they actually increase in capacity, that that is absolutely then a solid state battery. Don't care what they call it, because that was exactly what the papers by uh, Goodenough and uh, Braga had described was an effect of these batteries as they settled in. The batteries operate at a much higher temperature. We also discussed that uh, uh, previously. And they actually get, they actually become more lively and become more effective at slightly elevated uh, temperatures as opposed to the existing cells, which have uh, a bit of a problem with that. Um, we also mentioned that uh, Maria Helena Braga, uh, her passion was to try and get us away from the lithium ion. And so recently she's been a little cagey about uh, uh, what exactly uh, the direction she was going to move in. Earlier it was most certainly sodium, and so I still think that she's going to be working with sodium ions, but she's no longer actually saying that, whereas Mm, year ago or so, it, that was she was she was very open about talking about using sodium as a uh, uh, as a method to uh, to transport the ions. So, what she said recently was is that this new battery 
would not have a flammable electrolyte and would be lighter. Now, lighter than it is now, but uh, apparently still not quite, um, uh, not quite as energy dense as uh, the current lithium uh, ion batteries, but working in that direction so that eventually they would surpass the existing, uh, uh, the existing batteries. But remember that we also discussed that that doesn't really matter very much because you're not having to deal with the same issues that you have with an existing battery pack. And the two main ones are obviously the thermal issues. So you do still have to thermally control the, the, the pack. They're probably not going to be able to get away completely from that. But the other aspect is, is the degradation. You don't get accelerated degradation from operating these batteries at a higher heat. And you also apparently don't get much of an increased degradation by charging them fully and leaving them there or discharging them fully for longer periods of time. They still do have some uh, degradation, so I'm not saying that that's a brilliant idea, but that they're not affected as much by that. And because of that, then, if you're planning for expansion in the pack, in other words, uh, the uh, pack is designed to be able to take your car 370 miles with the idea that in eight years or 10 years or so that you're only going to wind up having 290 miles left, but that's okay. Now that is that part of the equation is uh, is altered to uh, to a great deal. And so there's a lot of these things that just kind of dovetail together. And so when we look at the new million mile battery for just what it is they say it can do, it's very clearly a solid state battery, uh, no, matter what they're, no matter what they're trying to uh, call it. Now, here's the interesting thing. In researching all of this, I found several papers early on that were very critical of uh, their claim that, that being uh, Professor Goodenough and Professor Braga, uh, that their claim that it was a solid state battery because they still are using something that, lo that looks and sounds very similar to an electrolyte. But they also don't describe a well-defined separator layer. Right? And so that may be where we find that, uh, that difference uh, between the two. And that's uh, that the electrolyte, if you want to call it that, is then acting as a, an initializer of some kind, but that the cathode is a solid state. Now we'll go back to what we said in our second video, and that is that I had my suspicions that they were going to be using garnet, and that's because of its, its magnetic properties. It's uh, uh, um, the ability for that particular uh, solid when in a matrix or some kind of an electrolyte that allows uh, the uh, interaction within the, uh, uh, you know, within that layer, that then it could act as a capacitor as well as a battery. And sure enough, well, the last week or week before that, uh, th that was exactly what uh, um, uh, Maria Helena Braga uh, came out and, and said in a joint paper. I'd have to look back up and see who, who else was, was on that paper. But that, uh, that these, the, the next generation of batteries will act as both. Very exciting, very exciting times. So back to uh, high bar a little bit. So what, what happened with high bar? Well, so again, the part that I, the part that I feel that, that I got right in my speculation was, is that Tesla is having to move forward with a all new type of battery architecture. And so I have to uh, thank uh, Gally at HyperChange uh, for giving me a shout out. That was great fun. I had a conversation with him last night where we, discovered that we agreed on just about everything. I, it, it helped them lay out uh, some of the, uh, the, the path of, of how we got here and how long I felt that we'd actually been working uh, towards this. And we had a great time doing, uh, uh, looking up some, some things online. It was great fun. But the one thing that we disagreed on was the architecture. He feels that they're going to be a round cell. And uh, I am pretty certain that they're going to go with, uh, uh, with a pouch. And so uh, um, 
uh, I'll present to you the reason why I feel that's the case. So here we have some batteries here that are in a uh, cylindrical architecture. These are just regular C cell batteries. But in, when you hold four of them together or any number of them together and you look at what you have left, there is a space in between there that nobody engineered for. That space is there because these are cylindrical. Now, when you have a battery that's already prone to having some thermal issues, that's great. You can blow air through there. You can maybe expand them a little bit more and do what Tesla did and run a ribbon through there. You can fill the voids with something that will dissipate the, the heat into whatever uh, uh, liquid it is that you're, you're passing through your ribbon. That's fantastic. And so I think that they got away with the cylindrical cells for a long time. The problem is now that the new architecture of the battery, the new materials, poses one, well, two problems, two issues, let's call them that. And the uh, first of those issues, to me anyway, is that when you manufacture a cylindrical cell, you are coating it and then you are rolling it. Well, if you're rolling it with something that is uh, compressible, something uh, uh, like, a, uh, like a metal, uh, say like a metal oxide, then that's not too big of a deal. You can, probably, uh, you can probably get past that pretty easily. But when you're coating it with what we're thinking that they're coating it with, which is garnet, a monocrystal, as that spiral becomes tighter when you're trying to manufacture it, it might become quite difficult to then actually try and coat that uh, roll in a way that doesn't cause the surface to crack or fracture, uh, creating some kind of a dust or whatever that might act as an impurity in your battery when you roll it. So that's uh, uh, one of the uh, um, uh, one of the, the, the issues. And the other isn't so much an issue, but it is the fact that the new batteries are slightly less dense. Now, not so much that it really makes much of a difference, but they are actually slightly less dense. And so in order to make up for that, here we have some 9-volt batteries. When you do them in a pouch-style battery, now... When you put these batteries together, there is no space in between that we haven't engineered. If we need space, then we will make space, and we will make the exact amount of space that we need to install whatever current, uh, whatever uh, uh, thermal management system loop that we uh, are going to uh, provide, and uh, and any other hardware that has to be present in the battery pack, but. We can stack them closer together because they have less of a susceptibility to degradation from heat. And, in, and again, as we discussed, in fact, they work slightly more efficiently when they are a little bit warmer. So that brings us to yet another thing that I think we got spot on. We talked about the running of the modified Plaid Model S at the Nürburgring. And obviously, we've got this competition between Porsche and Tesla and all of that, and that's all very interesting. But the thing that I latched on to was, how did it do that? How did it do that? Because we've already seen Model S's run the Nürburgring. And we've seen their times. And we've seen that at some point in the lap that they lose power because there's too much heat built up in the uh, battery pack and in the motors. And so then the car, to save itself, goes into a reduced power mode. Well, Tesla could have certainly just shut that off for 7 minutes and 20 seconds wouldn't have been wise to do because they're not in it just 
for the competition between Porsche just to say that they won. They're in it to actually go to the next level. At least I'm convinced that, that's, that that was what they were doing. They were trying to test the batteries that were going to be used in the next generation Roadster. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Well, now we learn that that Tesla Model S that they raced around the track, the Plaid prototype, has a bigger battery in it than the uh, standard Model S, exactly what we uh, had predicted. But again, how is that possible? Well, if you're going to be figuring out a way to stick a 200 kilowatt hour battery into the new Roadster, you're certainly now then capable of using the platform that's the size of what you have in the Model S to create perhaps a 250 kilowatt hour battery pack. It wouldn't be smart for you to do that and use up every last bit of the whole thing. It'd be kind of useless uh, as far as the amount of range that that would give you. But it would be very intelligent to go ahead and put, say, 120, 150, maybe 180 kilowatt hour battery pack in the passenger car, the Model S, and then go ahead and put this whole range thing to bed also put the battery degradation thing to bed. You now have a million mile car and the consumer confidence in that piece of hardware will go through the roof. And that is what I think that Tesla is banking on to drive the mass adoption of all of this. This is so very not, oh, you'll have to replace your batteries in a couple of years. Now, it it solves the range issue. It solves the battery degradation issue. People are going to be hanging on to these cars for decades. And I do not know how any existing automobile manufacturer can possibly survive more than about another five or six years if they think they're going to be making piston engines. And now we're also going to wind up seeing the very last gasps of anybody talking about hydrogen in a car. How silly, how silly. They've been competing against the lithium ion battery now for a long time. And it's all about infrastructure. It's all about these existing companies not wanting to let go of that pipeline. It just absolutely tears them apart to think that you can, you can have an oil refinery on your roof, that you can actually power your car from sunlight on your roof. And later this year, we'll go into uh, our findings with the Energy Sovereignty Project and, uh, uh, and, and all of that. Uh, so I hope that you stay tuned for that. Uh, we're already just under 10,000 miles uh, of driving on sunlight for our one-year test. We're now in our 11th month of our one-year test. And so very exciting about that. So we won't make this video real long. The last thing I want us to do, let's go ahead and look into our crystal ball. What do we see for the future? And so I want to deliver a little fun challenge to you, Gally, at HyperChange. Anybody who uh, hasn't seen HyperChange yet, I highly recommend that you go over and, uh, and, and give him a look. Um, Gally, I, uh, I think that you're wrong about the cylindrical batteries. Um, and I would like to pose that uh, when Monroe and Associates finally do tear apart one of the next generation Roadsters or one of the pickup trucks or one of the Plaid uh, uh, Model S vehicles that uh, let's see what they find inside. If they find cylinders, I will fly to the uh, uh, East Coast and get you a steak dinner. And if they tear into that and find that they are using pouch batteries or a square type of, uh, of, of battery that then you should uh, come, uh, come out here to the West Coast and, uh, and, and treat me to a steak dinner. So I await your reply, sir. And it was uh, uh, fantastic speaking with you last night and fantastic speaking with all of you here uh, with our updates. And we'll keep close watch on 
everything that's occurring now with Hybar and uh, probably give another update or so uh, in the next two or three weeks uh, as we start to lead up to the battery investment day. I think that we're going to learn a whole lot more about all of this uh, in the time leading up to that. But again, thank you very much for joining us. And until next time, we'll see you soon.